I'm pressing on the upward way, new hearts I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Good morning. It is good to see those of us who are out this morning and to know those who are listening and viewing this program. Always remember that there's a hearty welcome that awaits you when you come to Casita Road. It makes us feel that there is something about us that make you want to come to see us. And we appreciate your being here here and don't forget we want to know more about you so just fill out one of our visitors cards in the back of the pew in front of you and at the appropriate time we will get it from you today we want to begin a series of lessons on that one word called abiding that word is found in John chapter 15 and the first five verses I want us to read those verses first and then spend some time on verse number four. Where the Bible says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Or as the King James would say, the husband man. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. There are two interesting degrees here in this text. At one time, he talks about bearing more fruit. Another time, he's talking about bearing much fruit. That lets us know that everyone is not all at the same place at the same time. Not everyone has all the same abilities, but everyone is expected to bear fruit. Then the next question, where do we have to be to bear fruit? Of course, that is in Christ, and there will be a, a lesson to that. Abiding in Christ is indeed a wonderful privilege. We can never abide in him unless we know who he is and what he expects. Last summer, we spent three months talking about Jesus, who he is. And this should remind us as we go along in this lesson as to who he is and why we should abide in him. But here's the question. What did Jesus Christ mean when he said, abide in me? Now, one of Christ's most vivid and powerful illustrations for the believer's relationship with him is the vine and the branches. But what does it mean for us to abide in Jesus as a branch in the vine? Again, I repeat, one of the most vivid and powerful illustrations for the Christian's relationship with him is the vine and the branches. Now, just as branches can only bear fruit 
if they abide in the vine. So the only way believers can glorify the Father through fruitful lives is by abiding in Jesus. But, but here is something else to think about. If I am not bearing fruit, the next question or obvious question is, am I in Christ? Because if I'm in Christ, I'm abiding in Christ, then I should bear fruit. But if I'm not bearing fruit, then something is wrong with my abiding. Now, the teaching is found in John 15, where Christ prepares his disciples for his imminent death and departure. By instructing them about their calling and mission as his apostles. And emphasizing their absolute dependence on him. If you remember back in chapter 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now, remember now, he is talking to his 12. In the same chapter 14 and verse 26, he promises them the comforter after his departure. But now in chapter 15, he tells them, look, if the Holy Spirit is going to be in you, if I'm going to be in you, you have to abide in me. There is something for me to do, and there's a place for me to be if I am going to live fruitful lives. In verse 5 of our text, he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, so Jesus Christ emphasizes the calling and the mission of his apostles. And in the process of doing so, emphasizing their absolute, we need to get that word down. There can be no one else and nothing else. Absolute dependence on me. Without me, you can do nothing. Do we understand that? Now, so therefore I am learning that if I am to accomplish anything in life, be successful in anything, and that success continues, then I have to have a position in Christ that says if I stay in him, do my work, I will be disciplined enough to accomplish what I need to accomplish. Because Christ teaches us discipline. You have seen that in the, the disciples, on many occasions they show that they were not disciplined. And now Christ is saying, if you want to succeed, you got to shape yourselves. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, Paul was saying, I give my body. He learned to discipline his body. So that he will serve Christ. Everything else will take second place. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Yet doubtless I can do all things through Christ. Verse 8 is a special verse. In Philippians chapter 3. But the idea is. Everything else takes second place. Except Jesus. So Christ tells us in verse 5 again, I am the branch, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. Here's a question again. What, what, what the vine and the branches metaphor means? What, what does this mean? You see, the picture is a rich metaphor that needs unpacking. The vine is Jesus. 
while we believers or disciples are the branches. The Father says, or the Father, Jesus says, is the vine dresser. That is the gardener who tends the branches. Remember again, Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The branches need tending. Who is going to tend the branch? So if we try to be all sufficient or self-sufficient, then we are trying to nurture ourselves. And that can't, that won't work. It won't last very long indeed. See, he prunes the fruitful branches so that they will bear more fruit. And he takes away the unfruitful branches, throwing them into the fire. Now, now remember again, who are the branches? Not the world, but Christians. And there is the possibility that a Christian can forfeit his blessings. But if he remains on the vine and allows the vine to feed him, to nurture him, he will grow and mature. He will not be the same place today that he was yesterday. Or this year as he was last year. Every year he gets better. He is pruned every year. This is not a one-time thing. We are pruned every day. See, the unfruitful branches appear to be nominal Christians. That's like Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3. And we mentioned this Wednesday night about the three men, about the natural man, about the carnal man, and about the spiritual man. The natural man is the man who doesn't know Christ. The carnal man is the man who has one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And the spiritual man is that mature person in Christ. Now, as you listen to Jesus in chapter 15, Something is going to happen because he is going to mention Judas. He, he, he is in the program. What happened to him? What happened to Judas? He was there with Christ. He was one of them. The other disciples didn't know anything about him, but Christ knew about him. Here is an unfruitful branch. Give him his own time. He will fall away completely. And that happens to nominal Christians. Give you enough rope, you will fall away. There are too many temptations out there. You can't stand those temptations without Jesus. So just being a nominal Christian, my friends, you are in danger of losing your position. Now, the fruit we are called to bear probably includes both the fruit of transformed character, like that of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and the fruitfulness in evangelism as we bear witness to Jesus and his work. So two things here come as a result of bearing fruit, of staying or abiding in the vine. Number one, again, your character is being transformed. Christ is being confirmed in your body day after day. And number two, you will bear fruit in the sense of others seeing you and wanting to become Christians. Suppose I ask a question. You work every day. You go to classes every day. How many times have you invited your friends or your co-workers to even assemble with you? We are talking about nominal Christian and fruit-bearing Christian. 
If your character is being developed, your sensibility to evangelism would also increase and improve. Because you would want others to have what you have and know what you know. If that is not happening in your character, then you are not fruit bearing. And the question is, you're abiding in Christ, but to what degree? So we have to ask those questions. But what does it mean to abide? What does it mean to abide? What does it mean for us to abide in Jesus as branches in the vine? I believe three things are implied. Look at those three words. Connection, dependence, and continuance. Again, look at those words. Connection, dependence, and continuance. Now, don't think of these as three successive steps but as three interwoven aspects of abiding. Now, connecting with Christ, abiding in Christ, first of all, means having a life-given connection to him. Remember, he is the vine. I am the branch. There is a connection between us both ways. Inasmuch as the true, the vine doesn't need the branch, but the branch needs the vine in order for it to grow and produce. Now, a branch is connected to the vine and, and a vine to the branch. This is what theologians frequently describe as union with Christ. Notice that this connection this union is mutual. We abide in him, verse 4, and he in us. If there is no connection, then there is no life and no fruit. Number two word is dependence. But abiding also implies dependence. The branch is totally dependent on the vine for sustenance. We know that in the natural life. Now we have to apply it in the spiritual. I need Christ if I am to grow and mature and become fruitful. Without Christ, I will not be fruitful. Notice. L look at this abiding. Now, unlike connection, this does, it doesn't go both ways. The branch is dependent on the vine, but the vine is not dependent on the branch. The branch derives its life and power from the vine. Without the vine, the branch is useless, lifeless, and powerless. Now, Sap flows through the vine to the branch, supplying it with water, minerals, and nutrients to make it grow. And so as Christians, we receive the sap of Christ's grace through our life-giving connection to him. We are completely dependent upon Jesus for everything that counts as spiritual fruit. Verse number four. Remember in verse number five, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Look at the third word, continuance. The, first, the third word we mentioned, continuance with Jesus. Abiding also involves continuance. In fact, abide means to remain 
or to stay or continue. Again, for example, in John chapter 1, verses 38, 39, two of the disciples who first encountered Jesus asked him, where are you staying? They wanted to know where Jesus made his residence. And so the word staying is the same word translated abide in John chapter 15. To abide is to reside. To abide is to continue. To abide is to stay. To abide is to remain. This shows us that another aspect of abiding in Jesus is remaining in him. This simply means that we go on trusting and we keep on depending that we never stop believing. To abide in Jesus is to persevere in Jesus and his teachings. This is what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 8 verses 31 and 32 when he said, If you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's John chapter 8 verses 31 and 32. So in summary, to abide in the vine means to be united to Jesus. That's connection. To rely on Jesus, that's dependence. And remain in Jesus, that's continuance. But again, who is this abiding for? Who is this abiding for? And of course, that is the important question. Just about anyone religious reads this passage. Anyone knows this passage, John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. But again, we ask, who is this for? In one sense, Jesus is describing, or uh, uh, his description of abiding seems to be all and all or nothing deal. If someone abides in him, his love and his word, this proves that they are his disciples. To not abide in him and his love and his word is to show that one is not a disciple at all. So, to be a disciple is to, be, is to abide. But on the other hand, abide is a command. Look at the text again, verse 4. Abide in me. He is not making a suggestion. There are no ifs involved. There is no suppose involved. Abide in me because this is the only condition of bearing fruit. If you abide in him, again the question comes up. Am I bearing fruit? What about my character as a person? Has it changed? Has it developed? What about my ability to talk to others about Jesus? Is it better? So again the question, are you abiding in Christ or not? Listen, Jesus tells us in verse 9 of John 15, to abide in him is to abide in his love. It's something we have to do. So is abiding in Christ something that is true for all of us? Abiding like faith itself is a reality true of all Christians, but also an experience that we grow into by degrees. Before we move on further, again we need to ask, but how do we abide in him? First, we have to get into him. Galatians 3, 27. And to get into Christ, involve one must be baptized into Christ. So here is the... Conclusion, the logical conclusion. 
If you have not been baptized into Christ, you are not in him. And if you are not in him, you are not abiding in him. Simply because you may belong to a religious organization, that doesn't mean that you are abiding in Christ. And you also remember in John 12, 48, he that rejects me and receive not my words as one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So my friends, to abide in Christ means you have to get into him. <laughs> Listen, believing in him does not mean that you are in him. In John chapter 1 verses 11 and 12, he came to his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become. Simply because you believe, that doesn't mean that you are. You have the power to become. So how do I become? Remember now, we go back to Galatians 3.27. Here is Peter in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost showing them how to become. And when they heard the gospel of Christ, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. He didn't just leave it there though. He, he, he didn't leave it there as if he's just talking to the Jews. He says, listen, for this promise is unto you, Jews, to your children. <laughs> and listen, and to all those that are afar off, including us Gentiles. Everybody is included. You want to be in Christ? To abide in him? Then you have to get into him the right way. You don't just believe and be in him. You don't pray and be in him. You obey the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You not only obey it, but you stand in it. Listen, that's important. My friends, and I'm sure that you may have questions some more, but we're trying to make it as plain as we possibly can so that you, have, you really have to be something else to misunderstand. So those of you out there in TV land, we beg you to call us, write us, email us. We'll be glad to hear your questions and to respond to your near spiritual needs, that is, to be a Christian. Again, remember, you must hear the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins, confess Christ and be baptized. Then you are in him. And if you are in him, here comes the process of abiding in him. May God bless you and hopefully we'll see you next week, the Lord's willing, a continuation of this theme. Now for the rest of us who are here, if you obey the gospel, you are in him. Now for a while I had that frame up there, now let me deal with that frame. The classical Greek writers use the word men or meaning to stay. To stand fast, to remain, or to abide. Now listen, it has the idea to remain at home or stay where you are and not wander off. Now listen. The word translated abide is one of the Apostle John's favorite words. He uses it 34 times in this gospel and 19 times in the letters. That is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Want to show the importance of John uses small words, little words. And these words, though they are simple, they are packed. And all we're trying to do is unpacking that information. Christ says, abide in me. 
that means something that I have to take Christianity seriously. We have to take it seriously because it involves the salvation of my soul. Now the word meno means to dwell at one's own house. Illustration in Joshua chapters 2 and 6. The story of Rahab the harlot. Remember her? The children of Israel are about to come to the land of Jericho to begin their charge to the promised land. So some men, to, uh, some men are sent out, two men are sent out to, to see you know, what is the most strategic place to enter. So they come to Rahab's house because they were recognized. And here they form an agreement with Rahab because Rahab, like others, had heard about the coming of these people. They were destroying people right and left. And they were all afraid of these people. So here these two men are, more or less exposed to the leader of this country. But they found a hiding place in Rahab's house. And Rahab is not going to go down <laughs> without something. They want a place to hide themselves. So again, they come to her house. So what's the problem? What's, the, what's going on here? They have to make a promise. When these people come, Rahab is saying in my words, I want deliverance. But not just me. I want my mama, my father, my brother, my sisters, all my relatives. And so the men say, you got to stay in your house. You got to abide. You got to remain in this house, Rahab's house. Salvation was only to be found in Rahab's house. And they cannot go in and out. They have to stay there until everything is over. Did Rahab understand that? Yes, she did. So much so that she wanted her family saved. But as I usually do when I'm preaching about Rahab, just imagine mama, loving mama. Say, honey, I raised you up right. But here you're going to have a profession that I don't approve of. How do you expect us to come to your house, that place of ill repute? Could you hear Rahab said, but mama, the men of God say, the men of God say, you got to be in this house. <laughs> so you understand, we use that as illustration for the word remain. Salvation was in Rahab's house. We could go back even further to Genesis chapter 6 and 7 about the ark. Salvation was in the ark. And if you want to be saved, you got to stay there. But let's suppose while the water is there, some folks says, well, I, I need some fresh air. But here's a problem there. The same God who caused the, uh, the ark to be built is the same God who made provisions for them in the ark. If you needed fresh air, God already planned it out. You don't have to worry about fresh air. You don't have to worry about pork or beef or goat. Whatever meat you want in those 40 days, they all will be there. The point is, to abide means to stay. You cannot be fruitful if you keep 
going in and out, not sure of yourself. You are the person that James talked about. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. There is a certainty you have to have. As we go through the scriptures, we can see this all over. To have a friend who abides is to always be present and help in time of need. The Apostle John uses it to say, God abides in Christ. He dwells in him and therefore has a constant influence upon him. The divine presence is continually operative in Christ. Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The Father who remains in me does his own work. That's verse 10 of chapter 14. In chapter 10 and verse 38, Jesus said, The Father is in me and I in the Father. Now Christ is just simply showing us as the relationship with he and the Father exists, it ought to be us and him the same way. That whatever he does, he does it because that's what the Father wants. And whatever we do ought to be because that's what Jesus wants. He doesn't have to make this agreement with us, but because he loves us and he cares about it. So then how does Jesus accomplish what he does? His answer was, the father abiding in me does his work. Jesus is the one person who was completely at the disposal of the Father. And listen to his position in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. All right, could I use a certain amount of colloquialism? You ain't going to get to the Father without Jesus. Not by Muhammad. Not by Mahaulallah or Baha'u'llah. Sorry. Not by any so-called man-made apostle. It's got to be Jesus and Jesus alone. The Jews thought they could do it without Jesus. When you read Paul's letter to the Colossians and John's epistles, there was that group of people called the Gnostics who believe in this secret knowledge. They said they didn't know Jesus. And I want to close with, with John's own words in 1 John chapter 1. Because John had to tell them Something they possibly didn't want to hear. They were talking about Jesus as if Jesus didn't exist or as some third person somewhere. Listen to what John says. I like him. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we, the apostles, have heard which we, the apostles, have seen with our, with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. Oh, let's let, 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 let John talk to us in today's uh, simple language. You want to talk about Jesus? Let me tell you who Jesus is. You see, we were there. We walked with the man. We talked to the man. We ate with the man. We were in cross relationship with the man. You are talking about somebody you don't know anything about. You have not experienced him like we have. John could further say, we were up there at the Mount of Transfiguration and saw the display of Jesus. 
And you are saying that, that about some secret knowledge that you have apart from Jesus? Man, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. And if John was from Mississippi, you know what he would have said? So we want us to understand this idea of being a Christian, my friends, is more involved than we give, it cre or give credit to. Abiding in me, Christ says, as I abide in the Father. We call you this morning to this abiding. Come to Christ because you believe in who he is and what he has done. Come to him because you are ready to change your life in repentance. Come to him because you are ready to be baptized in him, calling upon his name. Come to him because your Christianity is flippant and shallow and you need to have some real sustenance, some substance. Remember what faith is, the substance of things hoped for, even though you don't see it yet. Come to him this morning, whatever your needs are, as together we stand and sing. How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood.